going to continue to use unit circle like at least one more time, right, and derive one more fun identity that you've seen before in the past and you may not have known where it came from. Okay? So um, my goal here is to get an expression for the sine of 2 theta. That's what I want. I want to know what the sine of 2 theta equals. Okay? Sometimes in earlier courses, you're shown what this equals. You have a formula sheet, but where does it come from? All right. So I'm going to go back to our unit circle, trying to make a case between the video yesterday and the video today that unit circles are really helpful sometimes, especially when you're dealing with, with problems in, in, in trigonometry. Okay. So here, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to draw a right triangle in here. Okay. I'm going to call this angle theta like I always do. All right. And since it's a unit circle, we know that the radius is 1. So we know the hypotenuse of our right triangle is also 1. Okay. Uh, we're getting there. Now, let's talk about the sides of this right triangle. We said yesterday, if this is the point x comma y, that one thing we could do is we could call the vertical leg of this right triangle y, but we also learned that x and y are both functions of theta, that if you know the angle theta, you know what the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate are on the unit circle. So using that reasoning, we are using this, this fact here, what we can say is, is that this horizontal piece of the, of the triangle, this horizontal leg, has length cosine theta, and the vertical leg has length sine theta. Okay? All right. Now, let's, let's go back to our goal for a minute. All right? Our goal is to get an expression for the sine of 2 theta. And when I look at this picture, what I notice is, is I don't see 2 theta anywhere. I just see theta. But I can easily just do this. I'm going to draw a second triangle. Here you go. And if I draw a second triangle, what do we know about? Well, I'm going to make this triangle a reflection of the red triangle in the x-axis. So I know when I reflect triangles, the triangle I get, the image, is congruent to the original. So this angle in here is also theta. Right? Okay. Now, that's... Uh, pretty promising, right? Because now what do I see? I see an angle, this whole angle here, that green angle, is 2 theta, and that's looking a little bit better to me. Right? Okay. Now, what else can we label? We know that this piece here is sine of theta also, because the triangles are congruent. Alright, so, and what else? Finally, this is 1. Okay. The last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to name this other angle up here in the corner. I'm going to call it alpha. You make alphas like this. Sometimes they look like fish to people. But that's an alpha. Greek letter alpha. Okay, so take a careful look at this picture. And we're going to look for some relationships. So it's helpful to remember an old law that you learned a long time ago. I learned a while ago. And it's called the law of signs. What the law of signs says is this. The law of signs says that in any triangle, that the sine of angle A over the opposite side A is equal to the sine of angle B over the opposite side B equals the sine of angle C over the opposite side C. So notice the little letters, the lowercase letters represent sides, and the uppercase letters represent angles. So I'm going to use that relationship here, is what I'm going to do. Okay? So we can write something. Here we go. Uh, looking at the following. I want you to look at this big outer green triangle. Okay? Well, let's try and apply the law of signs to that. Well, this is an alpha down here also, just so we know. So I could do the following. I could say that the sine of alpha, sine of this angle up here, right here, this one, over the opposite side, which is right here, over 1, equals... Now, I could use this alpha and this one, but that wouldn't be particularly interesting because I have sine alpha over 1 equals sine alpha over 1, so I'm not going to use that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this whole angle here, this angle in the corner, this 2 theta. So I'm going to say it equals the sine of 2 theta over the opposite side. So the question is, how long 
is that opposite side. Well, it's sine theta plus sine theta, or 2 sine theta. So here you go, 2 sine theta. Okay, that's pretty neat. Well, I'm getting close to my goal, aren't I? Because I wanted to solve for sine of 2 theta. I can do that here. If I cross multiply, I get the sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta um, sine alpha. Now, there's only one thing about it I'm not crazy about. It has two different angles in it. I'd like it to be just a function of one angle, just to have theta in it. So let's go back to the picture for a minute and see if we can't figure something out. All right. So notice um, we have a sine alpha that I'd really like to get, to get rid of. All right. So let's look at our upper right triangle. What I mean by upper right triangle, this red one right here. So if you look at that red one, if we were to do the sine of alpha in that triangle, and the reason I'm doing that is because I have a sine alpha in this expression I'd like to get rid of, let's see what we get. Sine of alpha would be opposite side, which is cosine of theta, over hypotenuse, which is 1. So that just means that the sine of alpha equals uh, the cosine of theta. And that was it. It happened right away. Very quickly we got it. Sine of 2 theta equals 2 sine of theta cosine of theta. That is a pretty famous identity. Okay? Something you study in an intro introductory tr trig course and so forth. That's where it comes from. Okay. So here we can really go two directions. First off, some of you might be saying temporarily to yourself, hey, what about the law of signs? Where did that come from? All right, so we really should prove that. And then there's also a few more identities. Uh, there's another identity for, like, the cosine of 2 theta. Right? So we'll have to look at, at what the cosine of 2 theta equals also. So uh, let's go prove the law of signs, and we'll come back and figure out what the cosine of 2 theta is. And, and then we'll, we'll go see what happens next. All right, so law of signs. And so here's, here's how we're going to do that. Let's start with talking about the area of a triangle. And at first you might think, oh, I'm not sure what that has to do with law of signs, but bear with me. Right, so let's say we have a triangle like this. I'm going to label things. This is angle big A. Here's angle big B, angle C. And then opposite A is side little a, and um, opposite C is side little c, and opposite B is, is little b. Okay. All right, so area of triangles. When we think area of triangle, we think of the, the famous formula, one-half base times height. That's what we think of. Area equals one-half base times height. All right, I'd love to use that here. There's only one problem. I have a base, but I don't have the height. I don't know what this vertical distance is. Okay? All right. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to start. We're going to assume the following. Let's make, a, make this clear, just so you know B is that whole length. We're going to assume angle A, side um, B, and side little c are known. That's how we're going to start off, just like that. And actually, I'll make this b a lowercase b, just so there's so we're clear about that. Lowercase letters for sides generally. Okay. So we're assuming that angle A, this angle in this corner, is known. Okay. I'll, you can call it theta if you like, or you can call it angle A. It doesn't matter. We'll leave it as angle A, I guess. Um, and this side here is known, and this side is known. This is sort of like a side angle side situation for those of you who've seen geometry proofs before. Okay, um, the goal is to get the area of this triangle. My claim is, since we know these three things, or there's two of them in particular, we can figure out what the height is. You ready? So here we go. I'd like to use this right triangle and a little bit of trigonometry to do it. So you notice I have angle A, I have the side opposite angle A, and I have the hypotenuse. So I can say the sine of big A equals the opposite H over the hypotenuse C. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the height is C sine big A by cross multiplying. So I'm actually done. I know the area of the triangle now, don't I? 
the area then would equal one half the base, the base is little b, times the height, which I just showed, is c sine big A. And this is a kind of a, a famous formula that you see a lot. Sometimes it's written like this. K equals one half B C sine big A. And it's written that way because you can't use big A over here on the left, because then you might think it means angle A. Right? So they just use this letter K, which is supposed to represent the area of the triangle. Okay. Now if you give it a little bit of thought, you'll realize that there's a few more ways I can write this area formula. For example, um, I decided to draw this original triangle with A in the lower left corner, then B on top, and C in the lower right corner. Just imagine I rotated all the letters. So imagine I started with this picture instead. Suppose um, A went to the top, B came down here, and C was over here. And suppose we started in the same way, we're same fashion, and we're going to assume angle C, little a, and little b are known. Okay? So we're saying we know the length of the base, we know that side, and we know the angle between them. So again, we could draw in the height, h. We could look at this right triangle and do the same thing. This time we would say um, sine of big C equals H over B. Or B sine big C equals H. And then the area would equal one half. The base now is A. And the height is B sine big C. All right? The thing that really matters is, is that the angle here, this angle, is between those two sides, it's between A and B. Just like how in the other example, or the other way we did it, um, angle A is in between sides B and C. That's all that matters. So if you have side angle side, you can get the area of the triangle. So right now we have two formulas. We have half B, C, sine A. We have a half A, B, sine C. And if you think about it, there's a third way we could have done it, right? Let's see what we have so far. We have A and B together as sides. We have B and C together as sides. We're going to do A and C. So we also could have had area equals, uh, let's be careful there. We'll say K equals 1 half AC sine big B. Okay, so if you've been following along, you might feel a little lost right now. But I'm saying, okay, everything you said makes sense. I know how to find the area of these triangles. And I know I can write it in three different ways. But what does this have to do with the law of sines? All right, so let's see. Let's remember, these are all finding the area of the same triangle. So what did we write? We had one area formula that said 1 half AB sine big C. And that number, whatever that is, would have to be the same as if I did 1 half AC sine big B. And that would have to be the same as 1 half B, C, sine, big A. We know this because, remember, all three of these formulas find the area of the same triangle. Just I've shifted the labels around. Okay, here, I'm, here comes some fun. Ready? You're not sure why I'm going to do this. It looks like you want to cancel things, but you, you can cancel the one half, for example, everywhere. But then the rest of it's not so nice. Like here, you can cancel A's out of the first two, but then there's no little A to cancel out of the third one. Right? If you took the last two, you can cancel the C's. You know, here and here you can cancel the C's, but there's no C in the first one. So this is going to seem strange at first, and then, then you'll see why we do it. We're going to divide everything by A, B, C, A, B, C, and A, B, C. And then this very nice thing happens. The A's and the B's cancel here, and you're left with sine of big C over little c. Here you go. You cancel the A's and C's here, and you're left with sine of big B over little b. Wow, exactly, right? Here comes the law of sines right in front of us. And then this equals the B's and C's cancel the last one, and you get sine of big A over little a. And that's the law of sines. That sort of justifies. All right, so now we have the law of sines. We need to go back and 
do one more thing. We just showed a moment ago, or a few moments ago, that the sine of 2 theta was equal to 2 sine of theta cosine of theta. Right? All right. And it required use of law of sines, which is why we paused to prove that. Um, what I'd like to have now is maybe an identity for the cosine of 2 theta. That would be nice to have. What is that equal? Okay? And for those of you who've seen this before in, in the past, if you've seen identities for cosine 2 theta, you actually know there's three, three common ones that are written. And so we need to sort of find out where they're coming from. Okay. I'm going to use some of the identities we already know. So let's recall for a minute. Let's recall that the sine... Uh, that sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals 1. So we know that. That's a Pythagorean identity. We got that from the unit circle. Okay. Um, as long as these two angles here are the same, then this statement holds. So if you want to write it some goofy way, like sine squared triangle plus cosine squared triangle equals 1, you can do that. As long as these two things are the same, it's going to work out. All right. So that's why I'm recalling this or, or, or looking at this, because I'm thinking to myself, all right, I know the sine of 2 theta. I want the cosine of 2 theta. And I'm noticing that the angles here, 2 theta and 2 theta, match. Right? So let's sub it into the Pythagorean identity and see what we get. So this should be true. Sine squared of 2 theta plus cosine squared of 2 theta has to equal 1. Yes, that's definitely true because these two angles are the same. All right, so now I should just be able to do some algebra, and I should be able to um, solve this thing for cosine 2 theta. All right, so let's see what happens if we do that. All right, so first thing I could write right away is I can say that the cosine squared of 2 theta is equal to 1 minus the sine squared of 2 theta. Okay? So I can write that. That's just moving the sine squared to the other side. All right. Now, a quick comment, like an editorial comment here. Never really been crazy about this notation, this sine squared, cosine squared thing. All right? What does that really mean? This really means the cosine 2 theta, that quantity, the whole thing squared. This really means 1 minus the sine of 2 theta, that whole quantity squared. Okay. And the reason I'm not crazy about that is because uh, I think this is vague. A lot of times you'll see in a textbook sine to the negative one power of x. Okay. So this really means the inverse, the inverse of sine, or sometimes written the arc sine of x. Okay. Which somehow people don't see this notation as often, but it's very clear what I mean. In this case, I mean the inverse function. It does not mean um, sine x quantity to the negative 1, which happens to equal 1 over the sine of x. Okay? That's 1 over the sine of x is cosecant of x. So that's why I get a little upset about this notation sometimes. Just a little comment. Is that sometimes this could be vague for new learners. Right? People first get this notation. If they know something about negative exponents, they might think, oh, this is 1 over sine x, or just cosecant. Right? But that's not what we intend. We're really saying to negative one power here, we mean sine inverse function, which means arc sine. This is the angle whose sine is equal to x, right? Not one over the sine of an angle. Different things. All right, so enough of that Israel comment. Back to this. We have an identity for the sine of 2 theta that we can sub in here. It's 2 sine theta cosine theta. So that's what we're going to do and, and see what happens. So here we go. So we have cosine 2 theta quantity squared equals 1 minus, instead of writing sine 2 theta squared, we're going to write 2 sine theta cosine theta squared. Like that. Okay? All right, let's keep going. So what do you have next? Cosine 2 theta squared. I'm going to stop writing this thing on the left of the while because it's going to be the same. Over here we get 1 minus, and if we square these things, uh, we have to square each piece of this. So 2 squared is 4. Sine squared of theta, cosine squared of theta. Okay. So we're getting there. Now I have two functions in here, and I'd rather just be, in other words, I have, here's what I mean by that. I have sine and cosine, and I'd like to get rid of one of them. So I'm going to get rid of the cosine. 
just making the choice to do that. So we're going to have 1 minus 4 sine squared theta times 1 minus sine squared theta. Now, why is that? Well, because we know that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 1. So that implies that um, cosine squared theta equals 1 minus sine squared theta. Okay? Now, just in case anybody's thinking, why am I going... Um, why am I going so far along here? Why did I just stop right here? I could have, but let me just be clear about my goal. My goal is I want the cosine of 2 theta to be a function of just theta, not 2 theta. In other words, I want to know the angle theta to be able to sub it in and figure out the cosine of 2 theta. That's my goal here. So uh, you might have thought, well, gee, why didn't you just take the square root here and here? I didn't do that because um, this is still a function of 2 theta. I'm trying to get rid of the 2 theta, and that's why the substitution was made. Because making the substitution, now I have just the angle theta everywhere, which is what I wanted. Okay, so we should be able to collect some like terms here. And so we'll just do a little distributive property. So what do we have? <coughs> we have 1 minus 4 sine squared theta, because that's what happens when you multiply those two guys. And then when you multiply those, you get plus 4 sine to the fourth of theta. Okay. So, this might be a little scary at first. You might think, oh, this, what's this about? It's a little nerve-wracking. All right. Fear not. Um, let me ask you a question. Suppose I said I want you to factor this expression, x squared plus 4x plus 4. So we're taking a little break from this. We'll come back to this expression in a minute. But I want to get you on some familiar ground. I told you to factor that. You would get x plus 2 times x plus 2, right? Or x plus 2 squared. Okay? What about this one? 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. Um, here we go. 2x plus 1 times 2x plus 1. Let's make sure that works. Well, here you go. Ready? Multiply these two together, you get the 4x squared. You'd have 2x times 1 and another 2x times 1, which should add together to give you the 4x in the middle. And the 1 times 1 is 1. That works. All right. So not too far a stretch. What if we had this? 4x to the 4th plus 4x squared plus 1. The question is, what small change do we need to make? Well, if I want to get 4x to the 4th, I need a 2x squared here and a 2x squared here, plus 1, plus 1. If you check this out, this works also. 2x squared, 2x squared, multiply 4x to the 4th. You multiply that by 1 and that by 1 and add them, you get 4x squared, and then you get 1. So, I'm going to put a little star next to this, because this example is in the same format as that. If you want to reorder it, feel free if it makes you feel better. Sometimes people like to do that. Okay? So what happens? This turns out to be 2 sine squared theta minus 1 times 2 sine squared theta minus 1. It's just got minus 1 instead of plus 1. But that's it, right? Isn't that fun? So let's continue. That means we can write this thing here as 2 sine squared theta minus 1 um, quantity squared. Okay? Actually, yes. And then over here we can write what we had, which is the cosine of 2 theta squared. Okay? Now, we're just going to be careful about one thing. Just, And I'm not going to explain this now, but I'm just going to tell you this thing squared is the same as this thing. Okay? And if you think about it, if I had factored it in its original order, I would have written 1 minus 2 sine squared theta, 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. That's what I would have written originally. Right? I reordered it here, but this is what I would really would have written. So I'm rewriting this in this order. And this equals the cosine of 2 theta quantity squared. So there you go. Now you have it. 
So you know that the cosine of 2 theta must equal 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. There is an identity for the cosine of 2 theta. Let's, uh, let's sort of just summarize this thing. So we now have that the sine of 2 theta equals 2 sine of theta cosine of theta. We just showed that the cosine of 2 theta equals 1 minus the sine squared, or 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. Well, that's not the only identity you'd see for cosine 2 theta. So keep in mind, um, sine squared theta equals 1 minus cosine squared theta. That comes directly from the Pythagorean identity. If I make a substitution here, watch what happens. You get cosine 2 theta, right, equals 1 minus 2 times 1 minus cosine squared theta. Right? And that's coming from this substitution. I'm subbing this thing into that thing. And what do you get? So you distribute the 2, right? That would become a, a negative 2. 1 minus negative 2, 1 minus 2 would be negative 1. So it would be minus 1 at the end here. And then negative 2 times negative cosine squared theta becomes 2 cosine squared theta. So that's another identity that might be familiar to you. It's something you saw in the past. Right? Okay. And then one more fun thing we can do. Let's take our original identity here. We had proven that cosine 2 theta equals 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. Right? We also know that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. So here's a substitution you probably never thought you'd make. I'm going to take this number 1 and write it in a much more complicated way. I'm going to write cosine 2 theta equals, and instead of writing 1, I'm going to write cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta minus 2 sine squared theta. That's where the 1 used to be. Sorry about that. But then watch what happens. You end up with the cosine squared theta, and you have positive sine squared theta minus 2 sine squared theta is minus sine squared theta. And that's a third identity for the cosine of 2 theta. Ah, good times.